Kamina is a ghost station in the south of Congo. There'd been no train service for five months, but now it's running again. The train left Lubumbashi, the nation's second city, five days ago. No one knows when it will arrive. In Congo, it has to be said, that's the way things work. Or not, including the railways. The train everyone's waiting for has a surprising name. The Iondel, or the Swallow, in English. Word of its arrival spreads like wildfire, and it's the so-called Bush Telegraph that has helped pass on the rumor. It's the cheapest rail service in the Congo, and stops at virtually every station like a bus, and because of this, it attracts huge crowds of passengers. Half of them are street vendors. At every stop, even in the remotest villages, the station becomes an instant market. Seven hundred francs a shirt, seven hundred francs. Come and buy my brother's clean clothes for sale. Seven hundred francs a shirt. Madam, yes, you who's pregnant, come and look at my baby clothes. But there's not much time for selling. The train is already packed, and you need to be quick to get what seats remain. Clément has been riding this train for 20 years and knows the drill. All the baggage that passengers have dumped in the entrance makes getting on board really difficult. We get on through the sides. Here are the toilets. We don't know how to get in in that way. Uh, there are packages and people on board inside, and, and it's very difficult. Sometimes people do their business in pots or in bags, and they just throw them out. Well, that's how people manage. People cram into whatever space they can find. Nearly 2,000 people altogether three times the officially permitted capacity. For those who weren't able to find a place or who can't afford a ticket, there's always the roof. <laughs> we have to come up here as there's not enough room in the carriages. We get by and that's how we travel in the Congo. <laughs> In the very heart of the continent, the Democratic Republic of Congo is the largest nation in black Africa. The Irondel crosses half the country, from Lubumbashi, the capital of Katanga, to Ilebo, and is the only link between remote villages and the outside world. It's 1,600 kilometers across one of Africa's last wild frontiers. But in the Congo, any travel involves problems. There you go, and all this because of the mud. Just mud. Roads may be in a terrible state and the trains bursting at the seams, but nothing seems to dampen the spirits of the Congolese. Okay, let's go. They've learned to make do, whatever the circumstances. Sometimes even at the risk of their lives by train, bicycle, or on foot. The Congolese have little choice. We don't want our children to do this work. It's too difficult, and it destroys the body. People like to party in the Congo, and one of the biggest celebrations is in honor of an unusual king, 
one of the most powerful in Africa. The Hirondelle has been around for over 50 years. The old engine was bought second-hand in South Africa. A relay of 10 train drivers is needed to cover the 1,600-kilometer-long journey. The driver is 63 years old. Mr. Malongo has one of the hardest parts of the trip. 120 trouble-ridden kilometers. Oh, we're fine here. In eight or nine hours, we should be arriving. Seven hours and 50 minutes if the going's good. In the old days, we used to do it in four hours. But the tracks become very bad and there's no proper maintenance these days. Mr. Molongo is the master on board and supplements his income by allowing 10 or so passengers to travel in the driver's cabin. It's as close to first class as it gets on the train. Oh Lord, guide my spirit and get closer to me. I will be safe with you. Back in second class, the challenge is to avoid stepping on someone as you try and move about the carriage. It's something Clément cannot get used to. There are no bunks, so you spend the night sitting up. You could put three people on this little couchette and still have enough air to go around. But there's five or six on one side and then five or six on the other. So with 10 or 12 people in the compartment, the conditions are terrible. Everyone has his or her baggage, half a dozen each at least. Well, there's nowhere to put our stuff. That's why we've used nails, you see, so we can hang them all here and there. The ceilings are full of holes, so during the rainy season, well, it gets pretty tough. There is the occasional miracle. My wife and I often take the train. She's over there. <laughs> and here's our baby. She was born on the train when we were on our travels. Our baby's called Consolada because she consoles us during all of this. Walking around is really hard. There's so much luggage and parcels that getting around is just awful. The train seems full of booby traps. As the train is moving along, this sometimes opens up, and when it closes up again, it could take your foot off. Or when it opens up wide, someone could fall through it and be killed. Last year, these snares maimed several passengers. Those in third class risked their lives up here on the roof, as the train's movement could knock them off.
Is that the funding? It's forbidden to climb up here, but we still do it. We have to work, even if we have to risk our lives. The rails are in poor condition, everything's ruined. You can feel the bumps, right? In the eight years I've been taking this train, I've had to face a lot of danger. Carriages that get derailed, people killed. I myself have been in eight accidents, but I'm not scared. If the train derails again, God will protect me. A day earlier, this young man had fallen off the roof. Miraculously, he survived, suffering just a cut on his cheek. I fell onto the rails. I nearly died. But I was lucky because God saved me. That's why I'm still here. His fellow travelers up on third class have to remain alert. Any lack of attention could be fatal. I prefer to lie down. If you stand, you might get chopped in two. The danger comes not just from above, but also from the sides. Even at a moderate speed of 30 kilometers an hour, a tree branch can cut like a machete. I've never been hit myself, but it would be dangerous to get hit in the eye by a branch. If you get hit on the head, it can knock you out. Other forms of transport exist, but are hardly in any better condition. Look at the road down there, it's just terrible. The trucks, though, still try and get through to get to the villages. This track, which runs alongside the railway, is National Route 1, a major road through Congo, running from Lubumbashi to Kinshasa, the capital. It's a vital route for the economy, 2,300 kilometers of impassable tracks in the rainy season. Willie drives for an NGO and he's on his way back to pick up aid workers in Kamina, on the only road into town. It hasn't been repaired for over two decades and every year it gets worse. Well, you need an off-road vehicle, a four-wheel drive for this kind of surface. You'd have a lot of problems if you try and use a small van in all this mud. Willie is used to it, but overloaded small trucks like this one are a common sight. He dreads being stuck behind them. Because of the state of the roads, we have to pull them out. It's a matter of drivers helping each other. But after helping, you too might break down because of the lack of fuel or a burst tire. We help each other out. It's all part of the driver's work.
Willie's troubles are far from over. 15 kilometers later, a large truck has got stuck. As it struggles to get out, it only sinks deeper into the mire. There's a hole and it's really bad. In fact, there's lots of holes here. There's no way around them. Unless another truck helps tow him out, the driver will remain firmly stuck. The truck hasn't the power to get out of the hole, and it takes a lot of power. How long have you been stuck? Two days. We're suffering here. The getting food is a problem. so much for solidarity as Willie keeps going. Further on, there's another pothole, which has been there for so long that the drivers have dubbed it the Ancestors. Willie has another 180 kilometers of this hellish route ahead of him. Ah, it's quite bad. It's been raining a lot. There's much too much mud on the road. It should take seven days, but will probably take two or three weeks. This is a very slow road. Willie wants to waste no more time and has to drive through the night. The headlights are brighter when I clean them. But just a little further on, he has to push again. Look where they are. It's not a good place. I hope we won't be stuck here as well. Do you have a rope? Yes, we've got one. OK, here I come then. Reverse a bit. Just a little. Where's the other driver? Hey, come and get the rope. Man, it's all because of the mud. Just mud. It will take another 10 days to cover the remaining 400 kilometers. It can take trucks more than two weeks sometimes. These are amongst the most remote areas of Katanga. As dawn breaks, three men are getting ready for a long journey. They are traveling salesmen, trading in manioc, flour, oil and palm oil in the villages. The boss is Usman. We've got our bags to sleep in and mosquito nets because we'll spend the night wherever we happen to be, so we need to protect ourselves. Usman and his companions head out of Kamina to make their way to the small villages that dot Katanga, all the way to Kastatu, 160 kilometers away.
It will probably take them at least four days. Most of the villagers are in the middle of nowhere, and to reach them means taking the dirt tracks. So the Congolese improvise. They convert and reinforce their bicycles to withstand the poor conditions and up to 300 kilos of merchandise. The Congolese bike is called a Kinga. The first few kilometers are tough, along a sandy track where it's impossible to pedal, so the bikes need to be pushed. The road is long and we can only go very slowly because of all the sand and sometimes mud. It slows us up and it's making it very difficult. It takes remarkable willpower to set out on such a trip. My back really hurts. It's really very hard when you have to walk for so long. Our feet and boots hurt and, and now my kidneys hurt too. After two hours, the men are exhausted and take a break in the first village. Mama, Madam, do you have any water? We're hungry after walking and it's difficult to be hungry, especially up in the hills. Thank you. Not at all. The men gather their strength to face the hills. This is the start. A five kilometer climb. The men have to help each other push one bike at a time. Painfully slow. But to boost morale, they sing like the slaves of old. Gentlemen, get ready to applaud us. We're coming. We're very hot, but we're the strongest. By nightfall, they reach a village. For once, they won't sleep on the side of the road, but in a church. And the meal will be the only one they eat that day. I'm cooking some manioc. The paste has to be heavy so it fills us up. 
I need to be strong tomorrow when I wake up and to feel I can make it to our destination. We don't want our children to do this kind of work. It's much too hard and destroys the body. We've had to push the bike so hard sometimes that our lungs run out of air and we get sick. When I was at school, I never imagined I'd end up like, like this. I thought my studies would mean I could change my life. I never once thought I'd be doing this sort of thing. I wanted to continue my education and study law, but I had to stop. If God had helped me, I would have become a magistrate. I had hope for a better life. The village of Kastatu is 60 kilometers away. Another three days of hard labor. On the railway tracks, the Hirondel is halfway to Ilebo. When suddenly Mr. Malongo has to break. <laughs> A man and his family are on the tracks. By waving a red scarf, he's been able to stop the train at this tiny village in the middle of the bush. He says there's good reason for doing so. Hello, Papa. I stopped you because my wife is sick. She needs to have an operation. Okay, we'll, we'll take you. While the woman climbs on board, the other villagers make the most of the situation. But Mr. Malongo doesn't want to take everyone and decides to start up again. We have a baby. We, we have to get on. It's often like this. Hard work for little pay. The equivalent of barely 100 euros a month. Mr. Malongo is not just poorly paid. He is, in fact, rarely paid. Well, we do get paid sometimes, but we're owed 80 months in back pay, maybe more. It's very hard. We have to get food from the fields. And if we had somewhere else to go to or something, I'd quit this job. Eighty months of pay, almost seven years of work. Seven years of back pay that Mr. Malongo will never receive. To survive, he depends on tips from the passengers, and with his wife, he cultivates a small plot of land. Right now, though, his main concern is the state of the tracks. He has to reduce speed to less than 10 kilometers an hour. At this point, the rails are not really aligned anymore. The rails now begin to, to bend and curve like a snake. So I slow right down to stay on the tracks. And it's like that for several kilometers. When it's hot, the rails expand and there's not enough ballast to keep them in place. So, so they, they move, which is really dangerous and could derail the train. Accidents here are frequent. Alongside the track are the remains of a train that didn't slow down. It derailed and killed 76 people. Uh, the carriage came off the tracks. There was too much stuff loaded on it. That was why it derailed. It happened six months ago. And it often happens because of the state of the rails. Because they're no good. It's just not safe.
As the Iondel slowly winds its way along the tracks, it passes villages such as Bunkeya in the midst of a traditional celebration. Long live the king! Long live the king! His Majesty Godfroy Monongo, the king of the Bayeke, has ruled over his one million subjects for the past 16 years. Despite his debonair appearance, he is one of Congo's most powerful men. His kingdom is as large as Belgium and spreads over parts of the Congo, Zambia and Tanzania. His palace is in Bunkeya, in the middle of Katanga. Today marks the anniversary of a historic battle when his ancestor dared defy Belgian colonial rule. Let's sing for our king! Let's sing for our king! Let's dance for our king! We're in the fields honoring our king. No one is as powerful as the king. That's why he is our guide. Well, these celebrations in honor of the king date back more than 150 years. Majesty, you can make love to all the women. Take me! Take me! Dancing is very important. We dance when there's a birth, when you pass your school exams, and when there's a death to mourn. That's how we do it. I'm off to work. The following morning, the king has divested himself of his robes in favor of a business suit. He's holding an audience. About 20 people have already shown up, merchants and farmers whom the king meets one at a time. When the sun rises, open the door and there will be 20 or 30 people to meet in the morning. Oh, it's a full-time job. I give more than I receive, but I'm glad to do it. It's what we've been trained for since we were small. In Africa, great kings are generous. They can solve disputes and sort out difficulties. And out here, everyone seems to have a problem. How are you? Uh, not well. Yes, you need to go into hospital for your sciatic nerve. It's brought on by work in the fields, especially the sugar cane, which you do on your own. Your Majesty, tell me, how can I manage? Well, how much does it cost? I don't know. Okay, Jeannot will look after you. Give me 30 euros so this man can get proper treatment for his sciatica. Show me. This man has come to ask the king to help find his daughter a job. 
Oh, c'est juste une petite recommandation. Un petit I just make an initial recommendation. A little fee to facilitate her being hired by the mining company. It's a foreign company based near here. If there's a problem with the state, with Kinshasa, we step in and help out. And also, we know we sometimes smooth things over. When they're here, we tell them. Oh, it's a matter of give and take. They say we'll help you on a political or national level, but you, you help us find our children work. Give these 45 euros to Jeannot for transport. Thank you. The audience lasts about six hours, during which time the king hands out some 600 euros. He can afford it. He's a rich man. He's on the board of directors of one of the country's biggest companies. And he's also a senator and an excellent businessman. I studied political science and economics, business economics at Boston in Massachusetts. I was meant to work for Citibank in Tokyo, but unfortunately my brother died and I had to return to inherit the crown. There are hundreds of such kings throughout Africa, and not just for show. They have a political and social role to play on behalf of the people. Back in the bush, Usman and his two associates have covered a third of their journey. But the days got off to a bad start, as one bike has had a puncture. Ah, the inner tube is punctured again. It's the fifth time in one day. Well, it often happens when we're loaded down. It punctures more easily. Repairs are problematical. The only tool Usman has is an old pair of rusty scissors. Fate seems dead set against them. Uh, the tire is yet another puncture, and we must start all over again. Well, we'll take our time and sort things out properly so the bike will work well. If we try and hurry, there'll only be more problems. Now oh, we're looking for the hole. Ah, there it is. Usman has neither a repair kit nor a new inner tube. Instead, using a piece of rubber from an old one. And then, it's a matter of hoping for the best. Usman and his companions still have another 30 kilometers to go to the next village. And when it rains, it makes things difficult with all the mud on the track and everything is gridlocked. And even worse, there's no shelter. They've put up with fatigue, hunger and thirst, but have barely the strength to push their Kinga bikes any further. <coughs> so, as they do every time, they dig deep and find the force they need by singing. Strong and determined men. Strong men. Let's keep going.
This kind of life is very bad. So we put our faith in God. He's the only one who can help us. Our lives belong to him. And so he's the only one who can make them better. Maybe God has heard their prayers. The rain has stopped and they finally arrive. Hello, big brothers. You can come now. I'm here to do some business. How much is the bottle? The bottle is one euro. Call the other clients so they can come and buy. Ladies and gentlemen, come closer. The village chief acts as the hawker. The people here have nothing. They purchase from itinerant salesmen like Usman. Do you have a funnel? No. Well, I'll get you one. It'll be a lot easier. Usman charges double for his oil the price of the effort to get here. The closest shop is two days away. We're happy to have oil. Usually we have to go as far as Kamina to buy some, so we're happy to see it on sale now here. He did the right thing to come. Well, I'm delighted as everyone wants to buy my oil. I'm satisfied. Business is very good. And my children will have some food on their plates. So, yes, I'm very pleased. I can't deny that. <laughs> Ladies, take care. Thanks again. We'll see you the next time. The three companions' journey will soon be over. When they get home in a week's time, they'll have made enough to feed their families. Back on board the Hirondelle, the danger has passed. The rails are straight again. But just when everything seems more or less normal, Mr. Malongo has to deal with another problem. He can feel the train losing speed. And eventually, it comes to a complete stop. <laughs> the fact that it does so in the middle of a village is no coincidence. Mr. Malongo believes it was sabotage and he suspects it's the vendors who are responsible. In Congo, they are known as traffickers. It's the traffickers. They've cut this. The train stopped because there's no more brake fuel. So we need someone to repair it now. Those who stop the train know what they're doing. They also know the repair is quite simple. Other breakdowns are more complicated, and trains are usually repaired in a station. Bayunge is in charge of maintenance, but he only has a few spare parts for repairs. This is where we keep our tools. We have keys, uh, measuring instruments, a few spare parts like this uh, alternator. And we have some lights for nighttime. 
pour l'éclairage est allumé quand on va s'en faire des véhicules, c'est pour allumer la nuit. The other parts have to come from South Africa and can take up to three months to arrive, during which time the train doesn't run. To avoid the worst, we have the engine towed to this large depot. It's like taking someone to hospital. The Hirondelles' forced stop is a boon to many. The local salesmen have no other means of making any money. In these remote villages, people survive on the equivalent of just one euro a day. It's the passengers, though, who reap the biggest profits. They survive off the small trade the train provides, and every time it stops, they have the chance to do some business. Come and buy soldering iron. How much? 150 francs. Buy some. Victor's been riding the Hirondelle for 10 years. On this trip, he's selling soldering iron. The next time, he'll sell something else. Either way, the train provides him a living. For we traffickers, not getting on the train is worse than falling ill. It's our work. We're like miners. We need to dig in their holes to get their minerals out. We tradesmen have to travel on the train. Our children eat, go to school and live because of the train. Finally, 20 minutes later, all aboard, the train has been fixed. Hey, people, I'm going to Kinshasa. Come on, let's go. Victor is pleased at the business he's been able to conduct, having managed to sell his entire stock of soldering iron. He's keen to get back in the compartment where his wife, Gabriella, is waiting. Since they were married, she has never left his side. This is my wife. I'm a well-trained Congolese man. In this isolated village, Victor believes the traveling salesmen provide a vital social link. There are villagers who can't get hold of salt or oil, so we traffickers help them. <laughs> oh, it's something to eat. It's to eat, yes. Once again, the train begins to slow down. Another train is heading in their direction, on the same track. There's a crossing, you see, and there's a train that's already there, on its way. And there's a second track in the grass you can see over there. But the track, though, is covered with grass. It's a delicate maneuver, because the train in front will have to use the abandoned track. The wheels might slide on the grass and derail the train. The mechanic is spreading sand on the rails to help it along. The danger over, both trains resume their journeys. The oncoming train is transporting cargo and has no passengers, apart from a few clandestine travelers. The Hirondelle, too, continues along its way. There's just another 900 kilometers to go to Ilebo, her final destination. 
by traveling day and night and allowing for stops and repairs, it should arrive by the morning of the eighth day of the journey.